it's Hallie and I'm back with my first video of the spooky season. This is one of a couple of videos I'm going to put out for my favourite time of year. Your fave cosy YouTuber has amped up her surroundings. We've got candles, we've got roses, because today we are talking about vampires. We're going to talk about the fashion evolution of vampires and also get into the visual history of these blood-sucking creatures. Because how did we get from literal monsters to vegetarian 17 year old vampires who like to go to high school and also how did vampire halloween costumes come about i'm gonna take you on a tour of vampires in popular culture from literally the 17th century until now so strap in okay let's get into the history i'm particularly going to be talking about western depictions of vampires in this video but that's not to ignore that loads of cultures around the world have their own histories and cultures around blood-sucking creatures. Vampires, or at least blood-drinking creatures, have been around for literally centuries. You can trace their roots as far back as Mesopotamia or even ancient Greece. However, the vampire, as we tend to understand it, came from 1700s Eastern European folklore. In the 18th century, there were tons of vampire sightings. People would dig up graves and stake those they believed to be undead. It was so prolific that even government officials were involved. It's important to understand that people really believed that vampires existed and people believed that these vampires were actually attacking their communities. I'll tell you one story actually, like a little sprinkle to set the scene. One report tells of a man who died at age 62 but returned to his son's house for food and shelter. His son refused and was found dead the following day. This report, along with many others, were well documented. Bodies were examined and case reports were written. This vampire panic lasted for several decades. But what did vampires actually look like in this era? Descriptions differ, but here are some common traits. Vampires were described as dead people who would escape their coffins at night and prey on the living. They didn't look alive in the way that humans do. They were commonly described as having bloated skin with a reddish purple tinge and also visible blood around their mouths. Rather than having a distinct clothing that would set them apart as vampires, they were often seen wearing the shroud they were buried in or just the clothes that they were buried in. Let's move into the 1800s. Vampire lit 1800s edition. In the 1800s, vampires exploded on the pop culture scene. This included works like Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Le Feu, and also, most importantly, Dracula by Bram Stoker. This is where depictions of vampires really start to change and clothing associated with vampires really starts to develop. I'm not gonna get into Carmilla in much depth because its pop cultural impact isn't as great as Dracula, but Carmilla was one of the first novels to describe vampires as seductive and beautiful. It's also what we would probably call fruity. I feel like this character will absolutely make a huge pop cultural impact in the future, but for now, let's circle back to Dracula. Dracula by Bram Stoker was published in 1897 and made waves in popular culture. It was a cultural reset. It was an instant classic and still one of the most popular gothic horror books of all time. Descriptions of Dracula in the book can tell us some major things about his appearance. Pale? Check. Creepy? Check. Clothing? Ambiguous at best. Literally, go on girl, give us nothing. We do know that he wears a cloak sometimes, as well as a nondescript suit. Apart from that, Bram Stoker rarely mentions clothing in any detail at all. This feels really strange because most of us who can think of Dracula right now can see him depicted in a particular way and in a particular outfit. But at the time of the book, this outfit and this look just didn't exist. There weren't super fans who could conjure up the same look of what Dracula should look like. This comes a little later. Shall we move into the early 20th century? It's the 1920s now, we stan the black and white movies. Vampires were a huge focus in literature and film in the 20th century. They also started to cross genres, moving away from horror and science fiction all the way through to romance. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. In the 20s and 30s, two big hitter films showed on the silver screen. Both centred on Dracula and both had a lasting pop cultural impact in very different ways. Let's start with Nosferatu. Nosferatu is a German film which is very loosely based on Dracula. 
Basically, they wanted to do Dracula, but they didn't have the book rights, so they did Dracula anyway and then hoped for the best. Why am I talking about Nosferatu though? I'm sure this guy is definitely not the first image that springs to your mind when you're thinking of vampires. However, the film was one of the first to show how Dracula might look visually. This meant it had major sticking power in pop culture. The look of Dracula, or Graf Orlok, was conceptualized by a man called Alvin Grau. Grau was a German costume designer, producer, and director. There's a wonderful blog called The Art of Costume where you can actually take a good look at the initial sketches for this character. They show an oversized gaunt creature with like hulking shoulders. The actor who played Graf Orlok in the film is called Max Schreck. Now, Max was a big guy, so he was actually the perfect fit for the role. To make him look visibly less human, he wore things like prosthetic ears, fake fingers, a bald cap, and prosthetic teeth. It gives the effect of Orlok as some sort of scary, imposing shadow creature. As I said earlier, this is one of the first times that people actually got to see Dracula. However, it didn't end up being the most popular image we conjure up when we think of vampires today. However, Nosferatu does live on in the eyes of film buffs, or should I say, Buffy. So a fun fact, the master in Buffy is actually based off the image of Nosferatu. I'm gonna get back to Buffy, we're getting there, don't you worry. Dracula on stage and on screen. So how did we get from these descriptions and depictions of vampire to our high collared, tuxedo clad, fanged bestie that we know and love today? Why is it that we associate these pieces with vampires. Let's talk about Dracula 1931 starring Bela Lugosi. In 1931, Dracula was brought to the silver screen. It allowed fans and the public to actually see a real adaptation of the book for the first time. The production helped solidify in our consciousness the classic vampire look. So the art of costume says about this, from his first appearance on screen, you know precisely what Bela Lugosi's Dracula is all about aristocratic charm and coiffed creepiness. As he descends the staircase of his castle, you feel the full effect of his performance and costume. The off-putting nature of his distant but impeccable manners towards Renfield are accentuated by the beautifully tailored tuxedo and opera cape that obscures his shape and the medallion signaling his status. This full image of Dracula is super well known. Depictions of Dracula still follow this tux, cape and collar equation. But did it really start with this film? Actually, it didn't. In 1924, Dracula was adapted for the stage in London. It was actually this production that brought this iteration of Dracula's look to life. And why this look? Well, the actor who actually played Dracula in this production, Raymond Huntley, actually provided his own costume for the play. And why the high collar? Well, it was actually created by playwright Hamilton Dean in order to help Dracula vanish on stage by like covering his side profile. The collar was basically a stage prop and wasn't needed at all for the film. Can you believe that decades of polyester capes and collars and that whole vibe was created by an actor bringing his own costume and a logistical issue on stage. That's pretty crazy if you ask me. But let's get back to the film. Obviously the film had a wider reach and an ability to be preserved for lifetimes in a way that plays just didn't have at the time. That's why Dracula's look is so much more associated with that film than it is of the stage production which came before it. And let me tell you how much of a game changer this film and this look were. When the film was finished, actor Bela Lugosi actually took his costume with him. It's actually said that he wore it in up to 15 more productions of Dracula in his time. This image of Dracula was so iconic that Bela Lugosi was actually buried in his tuxedo from the film. His family kept Dracula's cape and held onto it until literally 2019. Bela Lugosi's look for Dracula is still the first thing you see when you Google vampire Halloween costumes. That just really shows its impact to this day. Another thing the 1931 Dracula adaptation did, it transformed vampires from scary monsters into smart, witty, aristocratic men. This perception is still what carries through to this day. Enter what I like to call the beautiful and tortured souls. By the late 20th century, vampires were no longer these crazed, disgusting, grotesque monster corpses, for the most part. They're instead eerily pretty and tortured souls. 
They're cursed with their immortality and their need for blood. Let's get into some more iconic fashion and film history. We're not quite at Edward yet, but we will be there soon. Just wait a little longer. Interview with the Vampire. Interview with the Vampire, made in 1994, is described as a gothic horror and stars Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Christian Slater, Antonio Banderas, and at the time, child star Kirsten Dunst. The film tells of the stories of vampires Lestat and Louis, making their way through many eras of history along with their vampire child Claudia. Louis is being interviewed in the present day by a San Francisco reporter. The film is actually an adaptation of the 1970s series by Anne Rice. She wrote a whole series of books, like 11 more after this, and called them all The Vampire Chronicles. I feel like this film really represents a new depiction of what a vampire is, what he looks like, and most importantly, what he wears. The cast is literally filled with conventionally attractive men. When it comes to vampire makeup, they're made in a way which still accentuates their Hollywood features. This feels very different to the Graf Orlocks and the Draculas of the past. These vampires are meant to be undeniably beautiful. The costume designer for this film was Sandy Powell, who's done a huge range of Hollywood films. In terms of styling, we're not meant to have a vampire look in the Dracula sense anymore. These vampires wear looks that are accurate to their era. They hold on to the aristocratic air of Bela Lugosi's Dracula, but not necessarily with the same mode of dress. Instead of feeling super gothic, the costuming actually feels romantic. Even in the era where the interview takes place in the modern day, Louis holds on to some of that refinement from previous eras of history. The costuming all facilitates a transition from vampires being super scary, to vampires being a little bit scary, but mostly quite beautiful creatures. Do you see where I'm going with this? The Buffy craze. Now this show, this show was a cultural reset. Buffy the Vampire Slayer was a supernatural teen drama based on the 1992 film by Joss Whedon. The show, also by Joss Whedon, premiered in 1997 and wrapped in 2003. If you don't already know, the show Buffy follows a girl called Buffy, played by Sarah Michelle Gellar. Buffy is the latest slayer in a long line of people throughout history who are tasked with battling and killing demons, vampires, or anything else dark, dirty, and mysterious. It's one of the most hotly debated teen TV shows in history. Having read some of these academic texts for the show, here's my take on vampires. I think what's super interesting about the show from my perspective is that there's actually two different strands of vampires in the show that kind of work together simultaneously. Buffy's main enemy to defeat are these gruesome vampires that are actually kind of classic in their depiction. They have grisly faces when they're attacking, they're repelled by crosses and garlic, they're weakened by wood, fire and sunlight. You could kill vampires in the show by staking them through the heart. It's giving 17th century Eastern Europe, isn't it? However, there's also the beautiful and tortured soul narrative as well. The main aim of this show was to appeal to the fashion and pop culture loving teens and early 20s of the era. So whilst Buffy was killing vampires literally left, right and center, they also had to balance that out with like a brooding, hot, mysterious vampire love interest called Angel. 90s heartthrob, am I right? In the show, Angel is one of the most well-known vampires in history. In the 1890s, he was cursed by a group called the Kaldorash. They gave him his soul back so that he'd be forced to live with the guilt of his crimes for all eternity. They really said your whole purpose in life now is to be hot and brooding. This bitch walked. She fucking strutted that runway, mama. So that Peppa could run. Buffy successfully balances its traditional evil vampires with its hot modern vampire love interests. Let's talk about the costuming in Buffy and how it helps to further develop the vampire look in pop culture. During my genuinely extensive research into Buffy, I came across an article called Undressing the Vampire, an investigation of the fashion of Sunnydale's vampires by Robbie Dale. Robbie Dale basically argues that Buffy's stylists use alt, goth, punk and skater subcultural fashion to style the vampires and that this was done for a particular reason. Let's take a look at his study. Dale analysed the fashion of over 400 vampires in the show and found that 
over one in three was dressed in this alternative subcultural way. This could have been done for quite a few reasons. I think first of all, Buffy was a show that was made for people who like fashion. Buffy herself was costumed to wear cool new brands, cool high street brands, and also like high-end designer clothing as well. I think the othering of the vampires through clothing would have consciously or subconsciously got through to the minds of these fashionista audiences that were watching the show. To an extent, you might be able to pinpoint who is a vampire by looking at their costuming. I think another reason is because they wanted to show that vampires lived outside the rules of society. And I think alternative fashion is an interesting way of showing that. This all would have played on people's fears about goth subcultures at the time. And like, what was the 90s if it wasn't constantly shitting on goths for no reason? This all being said, you do have to take this study with a pinch of salt. To be described as alt for the study, you had to have two items or more pertaining to alternative dress in this person's terms. This included things like leather jackets and spiky hair, which as we know were pretty common facets of 90s fashion in general. Let's take a quick look at Angel's costuming too. In an interview for a magazine called Fashionista, Cynthia Bergstrom, who was the costume designer for Buffy season two to six, said of Angel's clothing. Angel was kind of a hottie. I would go to these stores on Melrose that dressed some of the hottest rock stars at the time and talk to the owners. They'd call me up and say, Cynthia, you've got to come see this. This is perfect for Angel. His pants and some of his shirts were Henry Duarte. He was always that sexy rock and roller. This is how costume design makes a conscious effort to tell audiences what to think and how to feel about certain characters in shows and films. It's blatantly obvious from this description that they wanted Angel to be this like sexy, cool vampire that appealed to young people. I don't know if Buffy knew what they'd done and also what was coming because the 2010s, the 2000s and the 2010s ran with this idea. High school bloodsuckers. We're here, we're doing it. We are talking about Twilight and the Vampire Diaries in this video. From the 90s and into the 21st century, vampires transitioned from these scary bloodsucking creatures to people who for some inexplicable reason want to go back to American high school. It's giving Predator, but in a completely different way. The idea spearheaded by Louis and Angel that vampires are now human adjacent, see the value of human life, and are capable of having feelings and falling in love was used to appeal to our biggest stakeholders. Mm? Stakeholders? In the pop culture game. Teenage girls. The idea can then be subverted a little to create a bad boy vampire archetype who's not actually a monster in the physical sense, like Damon Salvatore. Vampires are now outwardly and inwardly attractive, and this needed to be reflected in their clothing. The Cullens and the Salvatores are rich through hundreds of years of wealth hoarding, but they can't pull up to school dressed like Bella Lugosi. This means that vampire fashion and pop culture continues that shift into fashion that's modern and chic. Modern and chic enough for them to be perceived as upper middle class, but not rich enough that they can't fit in with high schoolers. Let's do a quick breakdown of the styling of our modern vampires. Common factors include basic tees, leather jackets, and straight leg jeans. It's normcore, but with a hint of angel. He was definitely the blueprint. Or maybe it was Mark Zuckerberg. The first Twilight film was costume designed by a woman called Wendy Chuck. A few apparent shifts are made when it came to depictions of vampires in the Twilight film. Chuck wanted to avoid dark and traditionally gothic clothing. She instead goes for icy palettes of greys and blues. Robert Pattinson said, we essentially look like normal people, but a little bit odd. You can't really go to some school in the middle of a little town in Washington wearing Prada. I feel like this totally encapsulates my earlier point. The reason why we still dress like Dracula for Halloween and not like Edward Cullen is because, well, if you dress like Edward Cullen, who would even know you're emulating a vampire at all? What now? So we've tracked the journey of vampire fashion and it's circled all the way back round to normal fashion. So where will vampire fashion take us next? Personally, I think the next vampire films will be really loud and will have like a fashion futuristic take on what a vampire should look like in 
later days. We've already seen this done in Dracula remakes and other avant-garde films like Only Love Is Left Alive, but I feel like another one is gonna hop on the scene and change our perception of vampires again. Will these vampires be sexy or our most gruesome and evil ones yet? To answer this, let's very quickly explore why vampire stories are so popular to this day. Some people have linked vampire crazes with economic downturns. Dracula was super popular in the 20s and 30s, and when did Twilight, True Blood, and the Vampire Diaries blow up? It was when the economy tanked. Vampires could be a metaphor for the brutality of capitalism. Karl Marx even uses that metaphor himself. In another vein, vampire stories could be an escape from late capitalist life. Another take, vampires are sexy. Vampires allow for sexuality and taboo to be explored through fantasy. They combine pleasure and pain. They're powerful and controlling and a lot of people want to explore that in their lives. I mean, how did Twilight turn into Fifty Shades of Grey? With our present day feeling more dystopian and wild, who knows what vampire fiction and fashion could be rocking our world next. And that is all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it has fully got you into spooky season because that's all I want here. If you like this video, please like, please subscribe and share it with your best friend because what is spooky season four if not for sharing vibes? Please leave in the comments below any of your takes on vampire fashion and where you might think it's going. Um, I'll be there to talk to you all. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video.